think there we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great, good to see you all. Um, thank you so much uh, to John and Vineshri for leading us so well this morning. Um, just give me a moment. I, I've got a few more things than usual to kind of get uh, get in place and and all set up. Um, so uh, yeah, as 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 John mentioned, uh, I'm Stephen. If we haven't met. Uh, let me add my welcome to you this morning. It's great to have you. Um, I have the privilege of, of serving as one of the elders here at Rooted alongside Kenny and Jono and our lead pastor, Oni Uh And it's great to be able to welcome you uh, here today. Um, as was mentioned, uh, we're busy with uh, Ephesians and we'll be continuing today with that. I think we are set up. Have you ever received uh, a wake-up call in life? Maybe uh, something happened that radically changed your perspective on something or made you realize uh, you need to change your life in some way. Uh, it, it could be an accident or maybe a health scare or maybe you lost someone close to you. Uh, and when these things happen, it's, it's a wake-up call. You realize how short life is. You realize what's really important to you. If uh, in the old days we had we had question of the day at Rooted Fellowship uh, where we'd get together and share. And so today's question would have been what what was a wake up call that you experienced? So you can think about that. And and for the sake of a bit of fellowship, everyone turn to your neighbour and say, "It's time to wake up." <laughs> Guys, it's time to wake up. Okay, let's get a bit more. Let's get a bit more into it. All right, it is time to wake up. <laughs> all right. So if, 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 you journey, if you are here for the first time today, uh, or if you have been sleeping through the past few sermons, uh, you might not know that we've been journeying through the book of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians is an amazing letter. It's written by the Apostle Paul to the early church in the city of Ephesus, which still exists today in modern-day Turkey. And before we read today's passage in Ephesians chapter 5, I'd like to give us some context, a bit of a reminder of the message of Ephesians so far, and I'm going to take a risk here and do it using a diagrammatic approach for the visual learners amongst us. Okay, so uh, it might help visual learners, but it'll only help insofar as I am a good writer. So let's see what we can do. Okay, so we're going to diagrammatically see the message of Ephesians so far, just as a way of recap. And it's going to be one of those classic diagrams with four quadrants. Okay. Uh, at the top, the top half of the diagram is going to be all about who we are, slash who we were. All right, who we are, slash who we were. It's going to be about identity. We're going to see, we have seen in Ephesians that uh, we have a new identity. Okay, I really hope I write clearly. But we also have learned that we have an old identity. There's who we were. All right. I hope it's coming back to you guys and that it's <laughs> somewhat clear. At the bottom of the diagram is going to be all about uh, how we live. How we live. Okay. I hope you can see that. So we've got who we are and how we live. And what we've been seeing in Ephesians is that who we are has a direct impact on how we live. All right, we've been seeing that. Ephesians started off by telling us that, that uh, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every blessing in Christ. This is who we are. We're in Christ. We've been raised with Christ in the heavenly realms. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. Ephesians 2 tells us that we were dead. Dead in sin, not just sort of uh, in danger or sick with sin, but we were dead, dead in sin. Uh, but we have been made alive in Christ, alive in Christ. We were separated from God. Remember that, separated from God. But now we have access to the Father. We've been reconciled, redeemed. Uh, we could go on. We can keep populating this. We we've also seen in Ephesians, especially chapter two and three that the blessings that we've received are not only for us individually, but it's very much about who we are as a people. All right, We are part of one new uh, community. We, there is a unity that is actually who we are. We have been made one. There's a unity in who we are. Um, whereas before, we were divided. 
amongst people, there was, there was a hostility between us and between people groups. We saw that. We saw that uh, in Ephesians 2. But we've been reconciled to each other. And now, as Ephesians 3 verse 10 says, we, ha we are now uh, God's new community on display. We are one new humanity. And the purpose of all of this, as Ephesians 3 10 says, is that God's purpose, is God's purpose was that now in the church, uh, his m he would display his manifold wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So his purpose in this all was to display his wisdom through the church. So we are now God's new, there's not enough space on this <laughs> board, new community on display. For me, that's kind of like the big message of Ephesians, as I'm understanding Ephesians currently. It, I feel like the one liner for what is Ephesians about, it's got, we are God's new community on display. And that's why how we live is so important, because it's a display of His beauty. It's a display of His wisdom. That's why we are told to put on the new, put on the new, uh, and put off the old, put off the old. Um, yeah, that, that so, so we put we put on the new, put off of the old. We saw last week um, when we when Oni took us through um, the second half of chapter four um, about some of the new things we must put on and some of the old things to take off. Who can help me? What were some of the old things, the old behaviors, the old clothes, the dead man's clothes? What are those things that we must take off? Lying, absolutely. Lying was a good one. Lying, we were told to put off, and in its place, we were to speak the truth in love. Speak truth in love. It's getting messy. I hope you can still see. Um, what else were we told to put off? Stealing, great. No stealing, but in its place, what were we to do? To work and give. What else? Anything else we were told to put off? Bitterness. Uh, there was bitterness and anger and malice. This thing is striking me a bit now. And in its place, we were to be kind and forgiving. Kind and forgiving. Okay, I hope you can read that. And it's not too messy. But the big point is that who we are determines how we live. We had an old identity, which is no longer true of us. We have a new identity in Christ. Uh, and that should determine how we live. All right, that is, uh, that is a, a quick recap of, of where we are. And what we're going to see in today's passage is that Paul wants us to wake up to who we are in Christ. He wants us to get it. Wake up to who we are and start to bring our lives in line with who we are. It's kind of the message that's already been started in the previous chapter, in chapter 4. We've been seeing this. We're going to continue to see it today. So let's read together uh, Ephesians 5, verse 3 to 21. Please turn with me. I'm going to be reading from the ESV version. It should be up behind me as well, so you can follow along there, or you can follow along on your phones or on an old-fashioned hard copy of the Bible. So let's read together chapter 5 of Ephesians from verse 3. But sexual immorality, in fact, before I go further, let's do it. Ani's done this a few times. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. It'll help us wake up as well. I feel like it's in, li it's in line with today's <laughs> idea, all right? Of we're going to stay awake throughout this, this, this sermon, all right? So let's read together from verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that anyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, we ask this morning that you would, by your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to a better understanding, Lord, not only of this text, but of who we are in Christ, Help us to grasp our true and new identity. I pray, Lord, that you would shine the light of your word on specific areas of our lives, that you would move us to change, and that you would motivate us to be a better display, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take a seat. Sex. That woke some of you up. That woke some of you up. But yes, our passage today starts off addressing the topic of sex. It speaks about how God's people are to act, think, and talk about sex. I'm sure you would agree with me that many of the worst scandals that affect the church and bring shame upon the church and the gospel are sexual scandals amongst its leaders. I'm sure you can think of of some examples. Sexual sin can do great damage to this beautiful display of God's wisdom that the church is supposed to be. And it's not just Christian celebrity leaders out there who need to be careful. I think you'd all agree, uh, certainly for me, that sexual sin presents a big risk. It can, uh, if we mess up in, in that area of our lives, it can ruin our marriages, it can destroy our relationships with the people we love the most, uh, it can ruin our witness, it can ruin our entire ministries and we may need a wake-up call in this area to make sure we don't sleepwalk into disaster let's look more closely now at, at verses 3 to 6 which, which speak about sexual immorality so sexual immorality is, is it's a, one of those old Bible words but basically it just means anything that is sexually immoral or sexually wrong and for the Bible uh, this includes any sexual activity that is outside of the context of a marriage between a man and a woman. And it's clear from our text, though, that it goes beyond that. It goes beyond just physical sex acts outside of marriage, but it also includes uh, all impurity and covetousness. So that would include indulging in sexually inappropriate thoughts or intensely desiring or coveting a maybe a person's body or a sexual experience with someone who is not your spouse. And this passage goes even further to prohibit any foolish talk or crude joking among God's people. The passage also gives us a valuable insight into the underlying problem with sexual immorality, why it's so bad. And it's there in verse 5. Have a look at verse 5 there. It's, it shows us that sexual immorality is idolatry. 
It's idolatry. So I if we engage in sexual activity outside of a marriage relationship, what we're saying is, this is something I absolutely must have. I know it's meant for marriage, but I, I simply can't live without it. And that's idolatry. Why did I fix this? That's idolatry. If you feel like it's something you have to have now, you can't, you can't live without it. It's idolatry. You're taking a good thing that God has given us, and you're making it into an ultimate thing. Now, y you might feel like this is unfair. I why do only married people get to enjoy sex? Some of you might even, even feel like you'd be willing to wait a while, but what if you, don't re you feel like you don't really have a great prospect at this stage of getting married? You might worry, what if I go through my whole life and never experience sex? If you feel that way, and I, and I, and I say it with a, you know, a lot of sympathy, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not an easy thing, I, I, I'm not being insensitive here, but if you feel that way, is it possible that you're buying into a lie that sex is this ultimate thing without which you're incomplete? Because it's a lie. And friends, there's a great freedom in exposing that lie for what it is. It sets you free if you feel like you're not missing out on some ultimate thing. By the way, married folk are also not immune here from the dangers and temptations of sexual immorality by no means, as, as I'm sure all the married folk will attest to. We can just as easily uh, be tempted by covetous longings, a feeling that we desperately need something different. We need a certain kind of experience or maybe a certain someone else. You see, if we make sex an idol, we will never be satisfied. It doesn't matter if you're single or married. Another way, or one of, the, one of the main ways in which the idol of sexual immorality reveals itself is in the way we talk about sex. We all see that the world is full of filthy talk and foolish talk and crude joking, you know, sexual humor, sexual innuendos. It's all over the movies, especially comedies. It's all over social media. We encounter it at work, at school. It's everywhere, and it does reveal an idolatrous obsession with sex in our culture, in the world we live in. Now, ironically, this idolatry elevates sex into something to be obsessed over, while at the very same time degrading it into something ugly to be laughed at. Think about it for a moment. When we engage in sexual activity outside of marriage, we do it because we believe it's this ultimate thing which we absolutely must have, but at the same time, we cheapen it and we degrade it into something less than what God ordained for it to be. And similarly, when we make dirty sexual jokes the whole time, we reveal our idolatrous obsession with sex while at the same time degrading it into something to be laughed at. So how should we as Christians think and talk about sex. Well, what does Paul encourage in the place of this foolish talking and crude joking? Have a look at verse 4. He says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, what does he say? We should awkwardly avoid the topic of sex? No, he doesn't say that. Someone's awake. He says, Instead, let there be thanksgiving. It's interesting, interesting that the corrective for crude joking is thanksgiving. You see, when we recognize that sex is a good gift from God and we give thanks for it, we neither degrade it into something ugly to laugh at, nor do we elevate it into an idol, but we put it in its right place in our hearts and in our minds. Friends, the world would have us believe that the Bible's views on sex are old-fashioned and outdated and inapplicable to our lives. And you'll find many s uh, appealing and convincing arguments out there to tempt us and to lull us into a place of compromise. There's arguments for why it's good to live together before getting married. There's very practical reasons for doing that. So many movies show us people having sex at the start of a relationship, and then they figure out later whether they also are in love. The perception is created that 
uh, almost everyone has sex before marriage. And you're kind of stupid not to. Movies like The 40-Year-Old Virgin teach us that staying a virgin that long is ridiculous and pathetic. But Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Don't be deceived. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on sons of disobedience. Very strong words. And the verse before that verse, I think, is even stronger. Verse 5 reads that you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. All this wonderful inheritance that we've learned about in chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians, those who are sexually immoral get none of it. But Stephen, what about grace, you ask? Surely we all struggle to some extent, even in this era of sexual sin, alone. Surely there's forgiveness available for us. Now you're absolutely right, there absolutely is grace. And the Bible does teach us that God is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins as we confess them to Him. But before we go, we rush to comfort ourselves with that truth, we should feel the severity of this warning. These are very strong words. And I think it's intended to be a wake-up call. So let's feel that wake-up call. But here's how I think this very strong warning fits together with the truth and the reality of grace. I think Paul is saying that because of these things here, these behaviors, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. That's an identity thing. We can write it in here. Let's see if the green pen works. Sons of disobedience. Very similar language to what we saw in chapter 2. By nature, we were by nature children of wrath. By nature, it's an identity thing. It's who we are. Our problem was not that we did sins. Our problem was that we were sinful by nature. All right? Sons of disobedience. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. So sexually immoral behavior is what you would associate with that old identity, with those who are dead in sin. And in contrast, Paul is teaching here that sexual immorality and filthy joking are not proper, as, as it puts it in the text in verse 3, or are out of place, as verse 4 puts it. Those behaviors are not worthy of the calling we have received. They are out of place. They don't match up. If we engage in those things, we are living in a way that is not in line with who we are, and we end up spoiling the display. Paul continues this argument from verse 7. Look at the next section with me. And he uses the themes of light and darkness. I'm going to try and read and point at the same time. So you can listen to me reading and watch me pointing. All right. He writes in verse 7, Therefore, do not become partners with them. I think becoming partners with them here is like participating in the things they do. That's what I think he means. Don't be partners with them. Don't participate in the things they do. For at one time you were darkness. We certainly were darkness. None of us got here through any intrinsic goodness of our own. We were darkness and we needed Christ to come and make us alive out of our dead state. We were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children in the light. Did you see that? It was, do not become partners with them by participating in their things. For at one time you were darkness, now you're light, therefore walk as children of the light. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do. Expose them. See, what's happening here is Paul is constantly reminding us of who we are as his way of motivating us for how to live. Constantly, the, constantly the things. This is who you are, therefore, this is how you must live. There's a story uh, about a lion who thought he was a sheep. 
don't know if any of you heard that story. The story goes that a, a farmer once found a baby lion that had somehow been isolated from his mother and was presumably left to die. So the farmer saved this lion and put him with his sheep. And the lion grew up with the sheep, naturally assuming he was also a sheep. And even as the lion became fully grown, he was a fully grown lion, he always behaved like a sheep because he thought he was a sheep. The sheepdog would chase him around like the other sheep. As soon as there was any danger, he'd just try and run with the rest of the flock um, because he thought he was a sheep. And it was only one day when he saw his reflection in the water that he realized he's actually a lion. What if I told you that some of you don't know who you are? I, I haven't gotten a full hold of who I am. I, I, don't, I don't think I have. I think the reason I still mess around and sin, the reason I'm less effective in my faith than I could be, is because I don't fully grasp my identity in Christ. I don't really believe this stuff enough. And I don't live out of that identity enough. I think sometimes we look at this stuff and we wish it was true. We wish we were that. But we know who we are. We know our backgrounds. We know our family issues. We know what we did in the past, things that have happened to us, what we've done. We know our struggles, our addictions, the places where we feel comfortable, where we, we feel we fit in. And yes, we were once darkness, but now we are light. Our new identity is our true identity. It is who we are, and nothing can take it away. It is who we are. We need to wake up to who we really are because our identity shapes our behavior. And modern psychology is beginning to catch up with that. I found an article, an academic article in a journal published just last year about something called identity behavior theory. Identity behavior theory. Interesting. And I quote from the article. It says, This article explores and discusses how enacted behavior, including intention and action, depends on level of subscription to identity. Psychology tells us how we act depends on level of subscription to identity. The extent to which we subscribe to an identity determines how we behave. Paul knew this, the Bible knew this, God knows this, God made us. And so our identity is that we are light in the Lord and we need to know that identity so that it shapes our behavior. So we read, we are light in the Lord and therefore we are to walk as children of the light. We are not to take part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead we are to expose them. We are to expose the works of darkness. What does that mean? I think it means that if we really do live according to the light, if we as the church put on a good display, then the contrast with the world will be clear to see. Contrast will be obvious. And this will allow people to be convicted of sin. It will allow people to realize their spiritual state of darkness and of death and of their desperate need to be raised to life through Christ. I think that's why Paul is so emphatic that about when he speaks about sexual immorality, he says that amongst you there, sh there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, not even a hint. Or as sometimes it's translated, it shouldn't even be heard of among you. And it's interesting here, that the subtle emphasis, as much as avoiding sexual immorality is very important for us as individuals for our own spiritual health, the subtle emphasis in the text is actually on what is seen amongst us. There should be not even a hint to be observed or seen or heard of among us. So th the emphasis is that we should look radically different from the rest of the world. If we allow some compromise here and there in our, in our community, we're going to start to blend in and the light will no longer expose the darkness. If everyone here knows that Stephen lo loves to make sexually dodgy jokes, here and there, and, and no, that, nothing really happens. He, he carries on doing it. And, and we know that there's someone in our community who has been known to cheat on his wife, and it never really gets addressed. And we know that there's an unmarried couple who live together, and no one really says anything. Well, over time, that bad example is just going to get worse and worse, and eventually we're going to perfectly blend in with the rest of the world. 
leaving nobody feeling terribly convicted about sin. On the other hand, here's the beautiful thing that happens when we do live as light and we do put on this beautiful display. We see it in verses 13 and 14. At first I found this confusing, but, but I got some help but from, from one commentary that tried to explain what's going on in 13, 14. We, we see that the light exposes the darkness that, and, and we read that that which is exposed becomes visible. In other words, people can see their sin and are convicted about it. And then, interestingly, once it is visible, it becomes light. There's like a whole transformation happening in these few verses. And think about it. If anyone is truly convicted about their sin, what does that mean? It means the process. It means the Holy Spirit's at work and the process of conversion and regeneration and of spiritual awakeness. That process is happening. God's at work, and, and, and it's a mysterious process, but it's at work, and that which was once darkness is now becoming light. All of us came to Christ in that way. We had to come, in, uh, to, to some extent, we were convicted of sin. That was certainly part of the process. And I think this is why it says in verse 14, which seems to be a quote from, from a hymn or a poem, it says, Paul says, that is why it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's the picture of people rising from the dead, letting Christ shine on their lives. And how amazing is it that as the church, if we live according to the light and put on this radically different display, more and more people will be convicted of sin and will make this miraculous transition from darkness to light, from death to life. It's a really important mission that we're on. And we have to wake up and get serious about it. We have to take personal holiness seriously. And what's more, as we now read in the passage, we have to make the best use of the time we have. We have to make the best use of the time we have. And that's what the last section of the passage is all about, making the most of the time. Have a look at verse 15 with me. It reads... Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Days are evil. Very interesting. I, I, I found, I wasn't sure what that meant initially. It's, it's a bit strange. I, I thought maybe Paul had made, made a typo. Maybe, m maybe meant to say the days are short or the days are numbered or time is short. Uh, but no, he wrote the days are evil. So what can it mean? It was helpful to find out that the, the phrase just before that, uh, make the best use of time, is more literally translated as buy back the time. Buy back the time or redeem the time, as some translations put it. So the idea here is the same as redeeming someone out of slavery. In those days, it was a familiar concept of you would buy a slave out of slavery from their owner. So I think the sense here is that time has another master an evil master, and we need to buy back the time. I think what we see here is a spiritual battle for our time. It's as if we are on a mission to be God's new community on display, shining a powerful light for all to see, but the enemy is using time against us to keep us ineffective, busy, and distracted from the mission. He wants to keep us subdued, wants to keep us asleep. If it was true for the Ephesians, it's more true for us today. Today's world, many features of today's world are explicitly designed to distract us and to grab our attention. We all know this. And people are reacting in different ways. You might have heard of like the minimalist approach to life or minimalist philosophy where people are just trying to like go back to the basics. It's not necessarily even a Christian movement, but I found this interesting ec extract from a minimalist blogger, a guy called Joshua Becker, and, and listen to what he wrote about the world. He says, our world is becoming increasingly filled with distraction. Information moves faster, louder, and brighter than ever before. Entertainment, social media, and marketing have never been so prevalent. They beg for our attention. 
our minds are diverted from more important work. We spend too much time checking email, watching television, or playing games on our phone. And listen to this. The battle plays out in front of us each day. It's not even a Christian article, but this writer recognizes there's a battle for our time. We understand that the days are evil. So how do we buy back the time? How do we win it back? Let's look at the text. The text helps us. Notice in verse 15 to 18, three ways to sleep our way through life contrast directly with three ways to wake up and get on with what God is doing in and through his people. There's a diagram, that, that one. Three ways to sleep our way through life, three ways to wake up and get on with what God is doing. We see that we are told not to live unwisely, but to live wisely. We're told not to be foolish, but to carefully seek to understand God's will. And we're told not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. The first two contrasts are fairly clear. Unwise or f and foolish living is careless, it's lazy, it's ignorant, it's a happily distracted waste of time. Whereas wise living requires us to look carefully at how we walk, to think very consciously about everything we do in our lives, to seek to understand what is the Lord's will in every situation. That's what wise living looks like. But the passage focuses more on the third contrast, the contrast between being drunk and being filled with the Spirit. Now, at first, you might think it's actually a, it's a comparison. You might think that just as uh, you could be influenced by alcohol, under the influence of alcohol, you should rather be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But that's not really the emphasis here. The emphasis is more on the contrast. You see, alcohol is primarily a depressant. I don't know if you knew that. It's primarily a depressant. And that, that means it works by slowing down your nervous system and by impairing your cognitive function. That's why people sometimes turn to alcohol to drink away their sorrows, to numb their pain, to escape from reality. But in contrast, the person of the Holy Spirit is more like a stimulant. He wakes us up. He makes us see things for the first time. He stirs us to action. And it's important, therefore, and it's therefore not surprising to see what are these stimulating effects of being filled with the Spirit. We see them in the text. Paul writes, Be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, submitting to one another. These are actions. He's stirring us to a picture of vibrant Christian fellowship. That's what it looks like to live in this world as awake. It's how we help each other stay awake. We might fall asleep if we, if, we, if we don't have each other helping us stay awake. If we neglect Christian fellowship, we allow ourselves to be taken out the game. We are distracted from our calling and we fall asleep. It's like that log that you take out of a burning fire and you put it aside. What happens to that log? It might burn as you take it out, it's on fire. You put it there, what happens very soon? It dies. It dies. Have a look at the next slide. You, you see these, it's sort of highlighting the red. Addressing, singing, give thanks, submitting. You can't get those things by watching a sermon on YouTube. Nothing wrong with watching a sermon on YouTube. It's beneficial, for sure, but who are you addressing in song? not each other. And it's interesting that, the, that we come together to address each other in song and to give thanks to God in our hearts. Who are we submitting to if we are doing Christianity on our own? We're not creating a beautiful picture which is primarily expressed through relationship. Friends, has it ever occurred to you that, has it ever occurred to you 
that neglecting Christian fellowship could amount to grieving the Holy Spirit. We saw last week that the Holy Spirit is a person and therefore he can be grieved, can be upset. And if, he, if, he's lovingly, if he's lovingly pushing us in the one direction and we resist that, he will be grieved. And we see here he wants, this is what he wants. He wants us to be part of vibrant Christian fellowship. If, on the other hand, you are going to be someone who grows into maturity, to be someone who is filled with the Spirit, then you're going to be deeply committed to Christian fellowship. Deeply committed. Instead of being someone who grieves the Spirit, you'll be someone who's filled with the Spirit, deeply committed to Christian fellowship. See, coming to church or or going to your midweek Bible study or family group or discipleship group, all of those things, it's not about getting a boost for yourself. Uh, the question uh, when you wake up on a Sunday morning is not like, do I feel like today I need like a bit of a spiritual boost? The question is, does someone else at church perhaps need a bit of a spiritual boost? Do they need me there? I must be filled with the Spirit. This command to be filled with the Spirit, it, <laughs> there's so much that can be said about it. Uh, it's a command. It's a command to be obeyed by all of us, not an optional. It's also, as much as it's a command, it's interesting that it's in the passive voice. We cannot fill ourselves with the Spirit, but we have to be filled with the Spirit. Or as some translations say, let the Holy Spirit fill you. Uh, I think this means that we need to yield to the Spirit, allowing Him access to every part of our lives, and thus allowing Him to fill our lives. It's also important to recognize that it's not just like passively hoping the Holy Spirit will fill me. Guys, the Holy Spirit wants to fill us. We are the ones who deny Him access, who grieve Him, or who quench the work He's doing. He wants to fill us. I mean, Luke, Luke 11 is clear that if anyone asks for the Holy Spirit, God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Let's bring it together. Friends, in in a world increasingly full of distractions, it's easy to sleepwalk our way through life, blending in with the world. It's time to wake up, wake up to who we are in Christ and to bring our lives in line with our new identity in Him. It's time to be filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing Him to make us into that which we already are. God's new community on display. As we close now in an attitude of prayer, I want us each to pause and to reflect for a moment and to just get a sense of, is there a way in which the Holy Spirit might be prompting us to respond? Let's close our eyes just as we are and consider whether God might be lovingly sending you a wake-up call today. Perhaps there's a wake-up call in the area of sexual sin. Maybe there's an area of your life where your your current behavior is not in line with your true identity. And maybe you need to decide today to raise the standard in that area. It might be how you act. It might be how you think about sex. It might be how you talk. Maybe some of us today need to lay down the idol of sex. We need to give it up. Or maybe you might have more of an addictive struggle where you know very well that it's wrong, but it just seems impossible to get rid of. Please would you ask someone to pray with you after the service. I'll be up here and others will be up here to help and just to pray with you and to encourage you about your your true identity in Christ. Secondly, maybe the Holy Spirit is, is convicting you today about your commitment to Christian fellowship. Maybe there's a wake up call to make the most of the time you have and to engage in the most important work of what God is doing in the church. If you would like to respond by getting plugged in, maybe into small groups or a discipleship group or to serving in some way, then please speak to Jono or to someone else who looks like they might be able to help you get stuck in. Finally, what if the Holy Spirit is giving you that very first wake-up call? It could be that maybe in your case, you, you have never yet 
properly responded to the invitation to come to Jesus. And maybe today, uh, maybe not only today, maybe in the last while, you, you can sense the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life, gently rousing you as if from a deep sleep. Maybe he's slowly opening your spiritual eyes. Maybe you're getting a sense that God is real. Maybe that he does love you. That he is calling you. Today can be the day where you take a clear step to respond in faith. If that is you, again, please ask someone to pray with you afterwards. Um, I'll be here, and I'm sure many others would be more than happy to pray with you and to help you take that amazing step of faith. Folks, as we close in prayer, let's, let's stand. Let's all stand and just, and just close it up in prayer. Holy Spirit, I, I want to ask that you would help each of us here today to grasp who we are in Christ. Please help us to get it, Lord. Please help us not only to grasp it internally, but to put on our new selves every day and to walk in our identity in Christ. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and fill our church. Come and fill our community here. Lord, help us to love each other, to serve each other well. Please make us into a shining display of God's glory and wisdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.